Maranatha, everyone. This is Pastor Jed, and this is another edition of my weekly video blog, Apologetics in Prophecy, where we like to take current events, put them through an apologetical and biblical lens to see just how close we are to the return of our Lord. And this week, um, our church, Calvary Solid Ground, which I pastor, is going to be embarking on a three-week lesson about the Millennial Kingdom out of Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. Um, we take a literal futurist view of the book of Revelation. We, we are pre-millennial, believing that Jesus' second coming will come before the millennial kingdom, and he will come to set up his kingdom. And we'll be talking about the various views and just really highlighting them on Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon as we do church. Uh, but we'll be looking more and focusing on the reasons of the millennial kingdom and their purpose and what the Bible says about them. But about that time period. But one of the things that we need to address, and especially in prophecy circles, is there seems to be this uh, bombardment on YouTube and other places of very charismatic speakers and people from the hyper-charismatic movement that are teaching um, post-millennialism packaged in a terminology that we like to use that's called New Apostolic Reformation. And so we want to look at that today and uh, give a biblical response to what they are teaching. Now, um, post-millennialism, of course, is a viewpoint that's been around for a very long time. And uh, it, is, it is saying that, that there is no millennium and that Jesus will come back at the end of this time period. The millennium is just a long period of time, and that's why it's post-millennium. Jesus will come back after the millennium. And uh, many of these people that teach this believe that because right now that it's the church's job to build the kingdom on earth and that we will make the earth inhabitable for Jesus to come back to. Now, just to give you a description, this came from gotquestions.org. The New Apostolic Reformation, or NAR, or NAR, as some of us will refer to it, is an unbiblical religious movement that emphasizes experience over scripture, mysticism over doctrine, and modern-day apostles over the plain text of the Bible. A particular distinction in the New Apostolic Reformation are the role and power of spiritual leaders and miracle workers, the reception of new revelations from God, an overemphasis on spiritual warfare, and a pursuit of cultural and political control in society. The seeking of signs and wonders in the NAR is always accompanied by blatantly false doctrine. So we're going to discuss a little bit about this. Now, a lot of these movements do not use the term New Apostolic Reformation. It's more of what we have used to kind of compartmentalize all the different aspects and different um, mentions of this movement. They go by many things like, you know, kingdom here on earth or kingdom now, dominion theology, um, you know, the seven mountain mandate. They have a lot of these different terms and each different group might repackage it differently. And even some of this teaching has uh, crept into mainline Christianity in some denominations and they don't even know it because they, it's, it's, it's so persuasive in its thinking and its argument that it comes into the church. But the New Apostolic Reformation is a title originally used by a person named C. Peter Wagner to describe a movement within Pentecostal and Charismatic churches. The title, New Apostolic Reformation, is descriptive of a theological movement that is not an organization and therefore does not have formal membership, see? So it is. it was coined by this C. Peter Wagner early on around the early 2000s, and, and he passed away in 2016, by the way, but, um, but he was like the originator of the term. So we're just using something that they called themselves in this book that he wrote. But there are leaders that are involved in this movement and they're different titles. And they would be uh, Lou Engel of the Call Ministry, uh, Bill Johnson of Bethel Redding, and locally we're familiar with a church called Jesus Culture that came out of Bethel Redding, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Rick Joyner, Todd White, and of course Kenneth Copeland. They all espouse one way or another to this um, new apostolic reformation, and uh, 
the church bringing the kingdom to earth. And uh, it really, uh, we have to understand that it's not new and it's not apostolic, it's not apostolic at all. And it's not reformed, it's actually deformed. It has its root in post-millennialism, and actually post-millennialism really started to gain traction in the second and third awakenings. Um, and that happened really, you know, a lot of people don't know that, that, um, that Jonathan Edwards was actually a post-millennialist. Uh, some of these people that were involved in these great awakenings believe that because they were seeing the Holy Spirit being poured out in people and communities and government and the United States radically being transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And their thought was that it was not going to stop, that it was going to continue on and that, that it would just build the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And it was because they were basing their eschatology on current events, on what was happening in the now and not what the Bible says is going to happen in the future. So Jonathan Edwards, great teacher, great person during the, during the move of the awakenings, but he was a post-millennialist. He really believed these things. And so, um, but, and, but then uh, after the Jesus people revivals in the 60s and the 70s, uh, it really started to, uh, you know, really started to gain more traction uh, and started influencing those from the Toronto blessing. If many of you don't remember that, that was uh, this supposed pouring out of the Holy Spirit and the 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 uh, reappearance of signs and wonders. And then, of course, the the leader that we'll talk we'll talk about here in a minute is the fivefold ministries. And it says um, they and it went and they they had different names. They called themselves Dominion theology or dominionism or kingdom now was a was a big popular term used around that time in the in the 80s and the 90s is kingdom now uh, but now it's more referred to as new apostolic reformation even though they don't use that title upon themselves that's what they it's become but they all have their root in hyper pentecostal movements and here are some of the things that uh, we notice that you will be a sign that you are involved or or listening to a teacher that is New Apostolic Reformation or post millennialist, and they have a doctrine which is called uh, the restoration of the fivefold ministries. You probably heard about that, right? And of course, uh, that comes from they 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 say it's out of Ephesians chapter four, eleven through twelve, which reads, "And he himself, speaking of Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists." and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, for the building up the body of Christ. And so they believe that, that God at this point in time is by, by these signs and wonders in these last days is again um, pouring out his spirit and raising up this fivefold ministry to bring in the kingdom of God. Unfortunately, if they looked at the original language, actually went back to the Greek, they would realize it's actually a fourfold ministry because it's apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors, teachers. They, then, you know, uh, a pastor has to be a teacher. Not all teachers are pastors, but all teach pastors have to be teachers. And teachers aren't, they're teachers, but they're not leadership roles. So it's pastor, teachers together in one. So it's really fourfold if you wanted to be technical about it. Now, one of the first references that I can find uh, it, it, of, of the fivefold ministry being mentioned was Edward Irving in 1824. Uh, Frank Viola gives an apt summary. Here we go. Irving, this Edward Irving began teaching that the fivefold ministry of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers has disappeared from the church and was in need of restoration. According to Irving, the restoration of these ministries would usher in the millennial kingdom of Christ on the earth. Irving and his followers began the Catholic Apostolic, Apo, Apostolic Church in 1832. Its chief purpose was to restore the fivefold ministry and usher in the millennial kingdom. The church ordained 12 apostles who were to be the last day's equivalent of the original 12 whom Jesus appointed. So we can already see that this is something that is attached to post-millennialism. They believe that God is restoring these offices that were originally there before the canonization of Scripture during the time of the apostleship of, of, 
um, ministry. And of course, we can go back to chapter the Acts when they needed to fill Judas's seat, that there was certain requirements. They had to be with Jesus through his, uh, re from his baptism to his resurrection and have seen him personally after he rose again from the dead. And th unfortunately, none of us can fulfill that position. But really, these gifts of the Spirit are listed in various places in the Bible, and there are more than just four or five of them. And they do serve a purpose in the church, even today. Apostle really means sent out. It's one that is sent out to preach the gospel. A prophet is one who just speaks forth God's word. We have God's word canonized in scripture. When we speak forth God's word, we're acting as a prophet. An evangelist is somebody who shares the gospel with the lost. And of course, pastors and teachers are those that teach and equip the flock. So they are in, they've always been in, in service. They don't need to be restored because they're already being done in the church throughout its history. And so this is just, you know, fancy false teaching that has been repackaged over and over again to try to say that. And, and what, what's sad about it is the fivefold ministry brings authority to people in the church that God never meant them to have. And that, that people are under the authority of these apostles as if they were under the authority of God. You are not to be ruled by men, but by God himself. Pastors like me can only lead you. A pastor shepherds the flock feeds the flock. It's up to you to follow. It's up to you to make that decision. A sheep can go any way that he wants. It's the great shepherd that will come and bring you back, not me. And so we need to understand that, 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 that in f lording leadership roles over people is not biblical. We also know that part of their doctrine that you might hear of that was popular, it's called the Seven Mountains Mandate, and that is part of their belief system. And it says uh, the Seven Mountain Mandate or the Seven Mountain Prophecy is an anti-biblical and damaging movement that has gained a following in some charismatic and Pentecostal churches. Those who follow the Seven Mountain Mandate believe that in order for Christ to return to earth, the church must take control of the seven major spheres of influence in society for the glory of Christ. Once the world has been made subject to the kingdom of God, Jesus will return and rule the world. That is basically post-millennialism in a shell. But they, the, the seven mountains, according to the seven mountain mandates, are education, religion, family, business, government, military, arts and entertainment, and the media. Well, how's that working out for them? The last time I checked that it was the World Economic Forum that was getting in control of these seven faculties, even religion in the world today. What about the LGBT human? That doesn't seem to be, uh, they don't seem to be slowing down at all. Look at even all the governments of the world. Um, it looks to me more like the world is marching exactly in position that the God said it would in his word. And so we don't see the church influencing these areas at all in the world, and especially in the community that I live in. In a community where there's churches on every corner, almost churches, I mean, Sacramento County has hundreds of churches, and I don't see revival happening anywhere in the culture and society around me. There are tattoo parlors and bars and pot shops popping up everywhere. Now, we know that during the awakenings and the revivals, those things all closed down. Things were changed and made different. So obviously, if, they're, if this is their charge, they're failing miserably in it. But we know that the reality is that the world isn't going to get better and better, that the church is not going to get better and better, that actually the world is going to go to a place that it has never been before. It's its lowest place on earth where the majority of humans on the earth will follow one man, the Antichrist, and will bring about God's wrath upon this earth. And once God's wrath is poured out on a world that has rejected his son, then Jesus will return and set up his kingdom. And so, because the Bible is pretty clear in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith. That's apostasy. Apost apost uh, uh, apostasy pursuo. It's a, uh, a departing from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. When people are teaching things that are anti-Bible, anti-truth, 
anti-God in many senses, anti-Jesus and the, what Jesus really is in the Bible. If you're at a church where God is telling you that Jesus uh, is is if if that Jesus expects you to be healthy and wealthy, then you're in the wrong church because Jesus doesn't promise us health and wealth. He promises us to never leave us or forsake us even when we go through times of poverty and through times of bad health. And when people tell you you just have to have more faith that be rich, that's a lie from the pit of hell. It is a doctrine of demon and they speak lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, not, not glory days, not a dominion or a kingdom here on earth. It says, some will depart, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. We're to turn away from those people. Look, this is a description of what we see around us, the reality of things. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. That is what's happening with Bill Johnson and Bethel Redding and Jesus culture. These are cults and that they actually believe that they are, their calling is they have a school of ministry uh, that is directed towards uh, raising you up to be miracle workers and revivalists and through concerts and conferences that they're going to bring about an awakening in the world. And it's their job to bring heaven to earth because they take, verses out of context. And so we don't ever want to do that. They are part of the prosperity gospel movement that has dwarfed into this movement that is funded by music and by, by mass hysteria and the idea of gold dust and feathers coming from the sky and it's bringing about a revival that is going to wake up the world to Christ and then Jesus will come and set up his kingdom. Nothing could be farther from the truth. That is a lie. We know that what the church is really going to be like in the last days, as Revelation chapters 3, verses 14 through 17 says, and to the church of the, to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. That's what these churches say. That, that, that your, your God wants, you to, wants to heal you and make you healthy and wealthy. And many books about you know, things that will, that will make you healthy if you just need to realize that the kingdom of God is in you. Because they say, I am rich and I've become wealthy and I've needed nothing, but do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus looks down at this movement and says that you don't even know what you're really all about. And what's amazing is later on, Jesus is depicted as standing outside the door of this church knocking. He's not even inside of it. Oh, they had the name of Christ. Oh, they had the Bible. Oh, they had a statement of faith, but they didn't have Jesus because they were basing their belief on experience and false teaching and not on the scripture and the word of God. These teachings are to be rejected and they fall short under apologetical under an apologetical microscope. That's what we're all about. We're apologetics and prophecy. We believe that if you take an, a biblical hermeneutical approach to the scriptures and prophecy, you can only come up with one thing, is that Jesus, there will be a seven year tribulation period where the earth will go under the rule of one leader, that literally hell on earth will happen in the worst time in human history and more than half the population is gonna die during this time. 
And then when Jesus comes back, then he's going to set up his millennial kingdom. That is when you and I, that have put our faith and trust in him, get to return. And so we need to stick to the scriptures. We need to stick to what God says in his word about the things to come, not what somebody tells you on YouTube. You need to be very careful. These guys are charismatic. They can, they can defend their position. They can make their point known through their speech in the way that they're, they're very deceptive. And so you need to be very careful. Filter all things through scripture. Ask your question, is this what the Bible says? Does this fit proper biblical hermeneutics? Look at other viewpoints and look at the Bible and find out what is true. And you'll find yourself be, you know, leaving those things and coming to solid biblical teaching. So with that said, um, I just wish you all a good week. Um, if you have never put your faith and trust in Christ, time is short. We see the signs that are approaching, what the Bible says, that the world is marching towards a period of time that has been recorded all throughout Scripture. And it's a period of time that you will not have to experience if you would only put your faith and trust in Him now. Because if you don't now, you're going to face one of the worst times in human history. Jesus said, unless those days were shorted, no flesh would survive. We know that, it can, that Jesus is coming at any moment to catch his church into the air. And in order for you to be part of his bride, you need to repent from your sins and put your faith and trust in him today. For the rest of you, I pray that you're just making sure that your devotion is right, that you're studying the word of God, that you're looking up and knowing that your redemption draws near, and that if you would like to join us this Sunday at 12.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific Time, Calvary Solid Ground, we will be teaching through the book, uh, the Revelation chapter 20, and looking at the Millennial Kingdom. And so we'd love to have you. Um, thank you for joining and watching this podcast. And as I end every time I start, Maranatha.